Okay. Welcome everyone to another of our amazing speaker series. Thanks to Diane for keeping organizing these. They're all always fun and inspiring. Today, questions will be at uh, IRC channel MOZSS, and you can also reach out to Diane if you want to get that again. So today, I'm really excited to introduce Tina Selig. She is from the Stanford D School. She's a professor of the practice in the Department of Management Science and Engineering. I had to write this down. <laughs> Faculty Director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and a founding member of the Hassel Platter Institute of Design at Stanford School of Engineering. Today, Tina will be talking about her findings and theories around how great innovations come to life, and she'll be talking more in detail about her invention cycle model. Specifically, she'll take us through her ideas for how you can use known methods such as brainstorming to not just generate new ideas, but also think about the problems at hand that you're exploring. And I'm really super excited about this specifically because one of the problems I keep coming over is how do we explore the problems that we are looking at in more detail and understand them better. So I am excited to learn about new methods and techniques that I can use for my day-to-day -day work while I do this. So with that in mind, I'll introduce Tina, who is in our Mountain View office. Great. Wow. What fun to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I am actually an avid Firefox user. In fact, I don't use any other browser. So thank you very, very much for all of your hard work. So today, I want to start with an easy question. What is a cat? Is a cat this? Is this a cat? Is that a cat? Yeah. Well, is this a cat? Yeah. Is this a cat? What about this? Is this a cat? <laughs> the fact is, all of these things are cats. And if I went around the room and asked all of you to define or describe a cat, you might come up with lots of different definitions. But of course, these definitions are an, informed by your experiences, what people have taught you, and the current context, right? The problem is, each of these cats are really, really different. And they'd be found in really different places. And this is why they actually have other names, right? A lion, a tiger, a house cat, a tractor. And in each of the other fields that we study, we also have very clear definitions, right? We don't use just a general term to describe everything we do because we need a terminology that allows us to be much clearer and more specific. Think about physics. You know, in physics, we have force times mass equals mass times acceleration. In biology, we understand the relationships in DNA. In math, we have lots of formulas to describe how the world works. And even in music or in sports, right, we all know what a C sharp is, and we all know what a home run is in baseball. The problem is we have not had this sort of clarity in the world of innovation and entrepreneurship. If I went around and asked all of you to define innovation, I promise you we, you would all have really, really different definitions. And in fact, that is a really big problem. Here you are in a very innovative company trying to do really innovative things. And yet if you don't have the same definition of what innovation is, you're all talking past each other and maybe trying to accomplish really different things. So I decided after years of teaching classes on creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship to put a stake in the ground and to take some time to think of a set of definitions and relationships that's going to help us actually get many more ideas through the pipeline from the seeds of the idea all the way through implementation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this framework with you. The goal is it is to be super rememberable, super easy to learn, to teach, to master, and to give you some tools that you can use starting tomorrow. And in fact, last week, I was fortunate enough to meet with about a dozen um, folks from Mozilla. And we did an off-site workshop where we went through this model. And we did a lot of exercises around these concepts. And so some of those folks are in the room today. And maybe some of them are even in San Francisco. And uh, we can get input from them on how they've been able, even in the first week after learning this model, have been able to implement this in their day-to-day -day life here at Mozilla. OK? So we're going to dive right in. We're going to start with the first definition, imagination. Imagination simply is envisioning things that don't exist. Make sense? Pretty straightforward, right? 
we do this all the time. A lot of people think that they're not imaginative, but they absolutely are, right? You had to imagine uh, what your day at work was going to be like and uh, get dressed in the morning. You didn't all show up in uh, evening gowns and tuxedos, right? You imagined what people would be wearing, and you were able to come here and, uh, and be appropriately de- dressed. We do this all the time. Creativity is applying your imagination to address an opportunity. It could be a problem, it could be a challenge, but it could just be an opportunity in your midst. So creativity is essentially applying your ability to envision things that don't exist to address an opportunity. Make sense? Again, we do this all the time. You know, every time you're hungry and you open up the refrigerator, you're basically going to say, how do I envision something that doesn't exist, like a peanut butter sandwich? And how do I then solve my problem of my hunger by envisioning something that doesn't yet exist? Creativity is applying that creativity to come up with a unique solution. So what I want to point out that's super important is that creativity is coming up with ideas that are new to you, but innovation is coming up with ideas that are new to the world. Okay, And this is a place where we really have an opportunity because most people conflate those terms, creativity and innovation, and as a result, they don't distinguish between an idea that might be new to you and one that might be new to the world. And since I'm sure that you're trying to come up with breakthrough ideas, you want to come up with innovations, not just creative solutions to problems. Entrepreneurship is then applying that innovation to scale those ideas and bring it to others. So I call this the invention cycle. And why is it a cycle? It's a cycle because the end leads back to the beginning. In order to be entrepreneurial, you need to inspire other people's imagination. And we're going to get back to that as we move through this process. So with this framework of this hierarchy, you can essentially then look at what actually has to happen along the way to become more imaginative, more creative, more innovative, and more entrepreneurial. And I want to point out that this framework and this hierarchy is actually something that, that's really relevant to other things we learn in our life. Consider learning to talk, right? Babies naturally babble. They apply those sounds to make words, those words to make sentences, and those sentences to make stories. That hierarchy of going from sounds to words to sentences to stories is very equivalent here. It doesn't mean you don't ever make a sound or a word or a sentence or a story. You now learn all those skills, and each one builds upon the one before. So with imagination, you start with some very basic skills. The ability to engage in the world and envision what might be different. Now, what you're seeing here is an attitude and an action. And at each of these steps, I share an attitude and an action. Why is an attitude important? Attitude is important because your mindset is critical to going through this process. This is actually really hard work, and if you don't have the appropriate mindset, you're not going to be able to make it work. Now, most people think it's the other way around, that you sit down and you envision the way you want the world to be, and then you engage in making it happen. But it's actually the opposite. It starts with engaging. Engaging and paying attention is the first step to seeing the opportunities around you. But most people go through life with blinders on, and they're not paying attention. But you know what? The world is filled with opportunities every single day. You're walking through things and, and, and stepping over you know, cracks in the sidewalk that need fixing. In fact, when we were just getting set up for this talk, we were realizing, isn't it crazy? That, you know, you're always wrapping around all the cables for the microphone cord. Wouldn't it be great if there was some way to retract it or to have a variable length? I mean, every time I give a talk, we deal with the same issue. I could decide that that was something I actually wanted to solve and go about saying, listen, this is a bug. Let's see if we can find a way to fix it, as opposed to having it all wrapped around and awkwardly you know, in my pocket. Okay? And the fact is, this happens everywhere. You see things that are a problem, and you see what the potential solution is. Right? So this is a before and after picture of, of a house, you know, sort of a fixer-upper. But guess what? The world is full of fixer-uppers, whether it's something at your own home, whether it's a house on the street, whether it's global warming. The world is filled with problems, and it's up to us to see them and then envision what might be different. And when you actually pick a problem that matters to you, whether it's something having to do with a web browser or where to go on vacation, okay, you then moved on to the next stage. And the next stage is a creativity stage. And this is where you now start addressing the problem. And this requires two things. 
It requires motivation and experimentation. Now, motivation, why do we care? Because you know what? If you are not motivated to solve the problem, you're not going to actually make the efforts to try to find the solutions. And understanding that the more motivation you have, the more successful you're going to be. But here's a trick. You don't need to start with a lot of motivation. You just have to start with a small amount of motivation. Because a little motivation leads to a little experiment. Most people think, and this is a huge problem, I need to be super motivated, and I need to do something really, really big. But if you start with a little motivation, wow, how might I fix this cable? Let me try something out and do a little experiment. Then the results might lead you to go, wow, that was pretty cool. Now I'm more motivated. And I'm going to ask around and find out if other people might be interested in that solution. And so then I do a bigger experiment. And that leads to more results and more motivation. And this is a little feed-forward loop. In fact, one of the best and most important things you can learn from this process here is the ability to do little experiments. And let me tell you a story that is really powerful. It's one I learned years ago when I just started working at Stanford. One of my first people I heard speak was Bill Gross from Idea Lab. You guys know Idea Lab and Bill Gross? The guy's totally brilliant, always coming up with tons of ideas. Well, he came up with the idea in the um, uh, mid-90s about uh, selling cars online. Now, this was the early, early days of, of e-commerce online and, you know, sort of giving people a few dollars to buy something little. Who would buy a car online? So he could have done what other people would have done, and they built an entire website and a database and bought lots of cars and stocked, you know, parking lots full of cars to sell, but he didn't do that. You know what he did? He put up a simple website, and the website just said, you know, basically, buy a car. And you click the car you wanted, and you hit buy it. And he put it up. There was no back end. There were no cars. There was no nothing. But you know what happened? Three people the first night bought cars. So you know what he did? Of course, he shut down the website. Because he didn't really have cars to sell. So he actually had to go out and buy three cars, delivered the most people, and lost money on each one of them. But at least he now knew that someone would buy a car online. This was an incredible quick, quick, quick validation of the idea. And this concept is now known as pre-typing. And this term was invented by a fellow who I teach with, named Alberto Savoia, who is quite masterful. He uh, had started a very, very successful company and sold it for $100 million. And then his second company started, ended up raising a ton of money based on that success, and ended up losing $35 million. And he said, what happened? How did I end up with that failure? And he did a ton of evaluation and realized that even though they knew how to build it, they could build it right. They were not building the right thing. Right? So pretotypes are super easy concept to end up mastering the ability to do super quick experiments that get you some early data to show if you're actually working on the right thing. And as he would say, make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. And there are lots of ways to do pretotypes. One, this false door where you set up a website and you see if people click through, or doing evil Google ads or Facebook ads and see if people sign up for something. A quick way to see if people are interested in your idea. But you can do pretotypes in other ways. You can have mock ups of things. You can, um, for example, Jeff Hawkins, who started the POM, his pretotype, which of course he didn't use that term at that time, was a wooden block. He made a block of wood with which was the form factor of the Palm Pilot and carried it in his pocket for a few weeks to see if he would actually use this and what sort of things he'd pull it out of his pocket to do. Because he knew he could build it. He had the technology to build it, but he wanted to make sure that when he actually put the effort and the time and the money into it, that he was building the right thing. And this is often a huge problem. I fallen into this pothole myself, where the first company I started, I had all my customers set up before I did, wrote a line of code, because guess what? I wasn't actually a programmer, and so I needed to, I was going to have to hire a bunch of people, and so I actually put together the whole market, and I had all these customers lined up before the product was developed. The second time, I did exactly the wrong thing. I threw a bunch of money and time and people at a problem before I talked to a single customer, and you know what? The whole thing failed. I can attest from personal experience in talking to hundreds of entrepreneurs 
that it's critically important to know that your customers are out there and that people want the problem solved before you go about and try to solve it. So now that you know you have a good problem, a problem that people care about, and you've now got some early tests, you move on to the innovation stage. And this is where you're going to push further to come up with things that are really new to the world. And this requires a couple things, focus and reframing. Now what is focus? Focus is where you say, you know what? This is now a problem that I'm, gonna, I'm not just doing little experiments. I am now putting all my effort into this. And I'm putting all my effort in a way that is going to allow me to look at the problem from different angles. So for example, the problem might have looked simple like this. What is the sum of 5 plus 5? So what's the sum of 5 plus 5? 10. OK. Sharp group here. OK. OK. I can see they do great recruiting at Mozilla. OK. But is there a way to solve this problem or to look at this concept, this math problem, and end up with, with a, a way to look at it where you don't end up with one right answer? Where you reframe it and you look at it from a different angle? What about this? What two numbers add up to 10? How many answers are there to this? How many? Infinite number, right? Negative number, fractions, decimals. Pretty cool, right? We went from a problem with one right answer to one with an infinite number of solutions. And this is where the innovation comes in. Because guess what? The first answers you come up with are always going to be expected and incremental. This is what happens is when people get a problem to solve and they go, okay, great, and you want an innovation, right? I mean, maybe it's an everyday problem and you just have a quick, quick creative solution to the problem. But if you want an innovation, you want to push further. And you want to look at the problem from different angles. In fact, Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, if I had a daunting problem to solve, if my life depended upon the solution, and I only had an hour to solve the problem, I would spend the first 55 minutes framing the problem. Because once I frame the problem correctly, the answer would become obvious. And I'm going to demonstrate this with one of my favorite examples. Um, in fact, it's very timely. Uh, I'm going to ask, does anybody have a birthday coming up? Anyone? Well, I do. <laughs> okay, My birthday is next week. And we could spend the whole time, the rest of the time here, brainstorming about the best birthday party for me. OK? Would you like to do that? OK? So you could do that and think that that was a great idea to brainstorm about the best birthday party. But if you change one word in that prompt to what? let's plan the best birthday celebration, what happened to the set of solutions? What happened? from a birthday party to a birthday celebration. Totally expanded, right? You ended up with a huge number of new ideas because you weren't having a party, you're having a celebration. What if we say, what's the best way to mark Tina's birthday? Wow, maybe it's not a party, maybe it's not a celebration. Maybe I should have a statue out in front of the office here for all the impact I'm having on all of you, OK? <laughs> OK, so the fact is, the question had the answer baked into it. This is actually one of the most profound things. When you ask a question, the answer was baked into the question. When we said, what's the best birthday party, we assumed it was a party. If we say we're going to have the best celebration, you're assuming it's a celebration. And when you say, let's find a way to mark the birthday, we're assuming we're actually marking it. And so questioning the questions you ask is critically important. I am a huge fan of the concept of frame storming. Now, what is a frame storm? It's when you brainstorm about the question before you start trying to come up with the answer. And this is critical. Because in every situation, we assume we know the right question. But by questioning that, you open up the door to many more solutions. That's often where the innovation is, is not in the answers, but in the question you asked. So, I teach these types of concepts to people all over the world who come to Stanford, and I travel around. And I've had the opportunity to teach three online classes with you know, 25 to 50,000 people in each one. And I teach these concepts of framing problems, of challenging assumptions, of brainstorming to come up with hundreds of solutions, often not the good ideas, but also coming up with the crazy wild ideas. And in fact, one of my favorite exercises that I had the team from Mozilla do is to come up with the worst idea for a family vacation, okay, or the worst idea for a restaurant, or the worst idea for anything. 
And then they come up with these crazy ideas, and then we take them and say, now you have to turn them upside down and to make those bad ideas into something great. And often what happens is those horrible ideas had the seed of something interesting. Because the good ideas, I promise you, were incremental, the ideas people thought were good, but when you had them come up with crazy and bad ideas, there was something interesting about them that ended up unlocking some real possibilities. So what I do in these situations, in these online classes, and even at my classes at Stanford, is I start with a very simple prompt. The prompt is often one word to just frame an area of interest. So it might be something like pets. Pets. What are the sort of problems that you might have encounter with pets? So help me out. What's a problem with pets? How might we, what's that? How do we feed our pets? What do we feed our pets? How do we feed our pets? When do we feed our pets? What else? How do I train my pet? How do I make my pet's life better, right? I want to make my pet happy. Well, we could go around the room and people all over the world and have questions about pets. And then the folks who are, who are working on this assignment have to pick the frame, those problems that they want to tackle. So maybe it's making my pet's life better or how to feed my pet or how to train my pet. They have to then generate at least 100 solutions. Why 100? Because the first ones will be expected. And then after they get to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, they start getting interesting. They then have to pick at least one of them to create a pretotype, remember, a simple experiment, and then share those ideas with the class. So I'm going to show you an example in this video. So I'm going to tee up the video. <laughs> come up with your idea that you think is pretty cool and really unique and really innovative, it's time to think about how do you get it out of the world. Um, people often conflate the terms innovation and entrepreneurship and think that you know, in an innovation actually has to be scaled. I think that's a huge mistake as well. There are lots and lots of innovations that people have that never see the light of day. Right? You come up with something fabulous in your garage or your kitchen. But unless you scale it and share it with others, you're not being entrepreneurial. And entrepreneurship requires two things, one attitude and one action. It requires persistence and inspiring other people. Now, what is persistence? Persistence is essentially grit. It's all the things they teach in all the other classes in our program. It's finance and marketing and strategy and organizational behavior and leadership and legal issues and negotiation and all those things. And that all is hard work. I mean, think about everything that it takes to just keep this company focused and going in the right direction. But one of the most powerful things you have at your disposal is your ability to inspire other people. Because ideas need a team to bring them to life. It's like a barn raising. You need people to join your team to play all these other roles. You need people to invest in you. You need customers who are going to be excited about using your product. You need people who are going to write on social media or write newspaper articles about you. Right? If you're doing this all in isolation, it's never going to scale. Scaling requires you to have other people on your team. And how do you inspire other people? You and I, you know, when we teach all sorts of things, I teach all sorts of classes on charisma and communication skills and all the things that you can do to get people to listen to you. But once they listen to you, you need to tell a compelling story. And I am a huge fan of this framework called the Story Spine. And it was, this was developed by a fellow named Kem Adams. And here it is. 
I'm going to share it with you. It's super simple. It's going to sound familiar. But it's actually pretty tricky to actually apply it and use it every day. But I promise you, the results are mind-bendingly successful. Here it is. Once upon a time and every day. And that really sets the stage for where you are now. This is the problem of the world, right? Once upon a time, there were speakers, and every time they went to speak, they had a pack in their pocket, and the cord was all wrapped around, whatever it is. Pick whatever problem you want to take. One, you know, any problem you're facing in your life, okay, or your company, or your family. Until one day, and that's the intervention that you're going to have. Until one day, and now here's what you're doing to solve the problem. And because of that, there's a consequence. And because of that, there's a consequence. And because of that, there's a consequence. And you can have as many because of that's as you like until finally and ever since then. And so what you've done is you've set the stage of what it, where we are now, the transition to a new platform, what the world looks differently afterwards. OK? It's really interesting to practice this. And I encourage you to do so because getting masterful, being able to tell a great story, makes you more effective in talking to your colleagues, talking to your boss, you know, pitching your ideas to customers, and uh, you know, investors, anyone else, your family. I'm going to show you an example of this. And it's another video, so we'll see if we can make it work. Okay? And again, there's, um, but this one has audio and video. OK, you're good. So, um, this last year, I did a project where I was working at San Quentin State Prison. And I was teaching entrepreneurship there. It's part of a program called The Last Mile. And it's an amazing program where they teach entrepreneurship to these men because they know when they get out of prison, they're actually going to have to be entrepreneurial, right? They're not going to be able to get jobs in the same way you do. They're going to have to really in reinvent their lives and, and often start their own ventures in order to have a job. And so I was so impressed with these guys, with how motivated and driven and committed they were to fix themselves and the world, that I brought my students up there. And I had my students come and teach the things we were doing in our class, teach them to the men in San Quentin. And then they got to know them, and they had to frame a problem around this prompt. The prompt was, redesign the experience of going from prison to freedom. So some of the teams looked at getting housing. Some looked at getting jobs. Some looked at getting reintegrated in the community. Some looked at education. And each one of them had to then frame that problem. And how many ideas did they have to come up with? A hundred ideas. They had to pick several of them to prototype and then to see if they got some traction, if people were interested. And then they had to tell a story. And they had to do a 90-second video that told a story about how this worked. Prison is tough but at least there are rules. The re-entry process is less secure. Recently released inmates lack basic necessities like housing, money, clothing, family, or job opportunities. Without guidance, shelter, or support, many former inmates feel trapped and fall into the same harmful habits that landed them in prison. These individuals need a point of contact, a level of consistency, and a modicum of emotional support to start over. Project Homebase is a host family exchange program created as an effort to incorporate life skills, a support network, and adequate shelter into a cohesive experience for recently released inmates. Upon re-entry into society, any inmate with no place to go is assigned to live with a local volunteer family. These families provide housing and help the individual gain life skills like budgeting, cooking, and resume building. More importantly, host families reinforce basic values like loyalty, honesty, and hard work, while providing a safe and caring space for these individuals to reacclimate to society. As the individuals gain employment and stability within their own lives, we hope they will pay the favor forward and teach others what they have learned along the way. Pretty cool. So not only did the students learn all of these skills that allowed them to um, come up with lots of, lots of interesting ideas, but they also realized that they could use these tools to address some really big problems in the world, not just in their own lives. So we're going to go on to skip that. Perfect. So here's the interesting thing. The end leads back to the beginning, as I said before. 
Because once you inspire other people, it leads to them to be more creative, more innovative, and more entrepreneurial. And it leads to wave upon wave upon wave of more entrepreneurial activity in your organization. Most people are not at the center of this invention cycle. Most people are not in the middle. Most people are not the founder. Most people come in like you guys, and you've been hired by someone. Someone inspired you to join. And then you get excited about it. You become more imaginative. You become more creative. You become more entrepreneurial. And then you hire more people. You influence more customers. You bring more people on board. And this is why this is such a powerful set of skills, because it's not just about you and your team. It's about the entire organization and the impact you can have on the whole world. Now, it's important to keep in mind that every organization needs to cover all these bases. But not every individual has to be an expert in each one. You need the imaginers who are engaged in the world and envision all the possibilities that can happen. You need those people in your organization. You need the creators, the ones who solve the everyday problems. You need the innovators who come up with the breakthrough solutions. And you need the entrepreneurs who know how to scale it. And you need to know where you are in the process. This framework allows you to know where you are. Like, you know what? Guess what? We're in the imagination stage. We're just trying to figure out what problems we're going to solve. Hey, we're in the creative stage. We're just trying to get a handle on whether we're going in the right direction with this problem. You, whether you're in the innovation stage where you're saying, you know what? We're really committed to this, and we're going to come up with breakthrough solutions. Or are we in the entrepreneurship stage where we're going to be scaling this? And of course, within a company, you're doing all of this at once, right? Some projects are in the innovation stage, some are in the entrepreneurship stage, and some are in the imagination stage. It's also important to keep in mind you can short circuit this model, this, this process. You can go directly from creativity to entrepreneurship, right? You can have one more cover band. You can have you know, one more coffee shop. But the fact is you're missing an opportunity to become innovative, to push yourself further. Most people don't do that. And that's a real differentiator is when you do that. I truly believe that by having this clear set of definitions that everybody uses, by understanding the relationship between them and the attitudes and actions that are necessary at each step, it allows every single one of us and whatever role we play in our organization to get many, many more ideas out of our head and into the world. So I was hoping that the folks who were here who were at the workshop would be able to chime in with some of their thoughts on how, I mean, now they've heard this twice. And I've had threw in a few new things to, to spice it up a little bit. But um, to talk about the pieces of the puzzle that resonated most with them and how they used it. And also then to invite everyone else who's here and people around the world to chime in with any questions. So yeah. Uh, Whatever. Do we have microphones we can pass around? We have two right there. Okay, good. So great. So maybe people could pop up here. So Rosanna, you want to talk about? Thank you. <laughs> great. Um, sure. So. So I, um, I thought it was really, uh, really great to see all of the, all of the um, cycle. We did uh, go a little bit more into how to frame, uh, brainstorm certain ideas. We had good ideas, bad ideas. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and we did come to very unexpected places. Um, personally, the the piece that I love the most was the one around uh, changing the frame of your problem. I, I think that, as you said, like very often um, we just come to the same solutions because we express uh, a problem um, in the very same way. So I, the the thing that I've been looking at uh, more is like there's there's problems that you know we've tried solving in a particular way for for a long time and just like taking a step back and reframing uh, that problem. So very often, like in my case, we would try to look at the processes that are not working well and. And, and so a lot of the solutions would be on like, how do we make this process better? 
because that's exactly the way that people would um, frame the problem. And when you ask yourself, well, maybe it's not the, the process that needs to be better. Maybe we don't need any process. Maybe people need something entirely different. Um, and so the, you know, the, the idea that, you know, taking the focus away, like in my particular case, like how do we make this process better? Just stopping there and say like, okay, let's not think about the process, but what are the things that are around the process? What is it that people really need? Um, do we actually, you know, let's forget about the process and what is the problem that we're trying to solve. So I think that that piece around reframing it and falling in love with the problem rather than the solution and keep on going with the same solution, although you haven't seen a lot of uh, progress there, I think that that was the piece that really resonated the most with me. And we're right. still trying to reframe some problems. Great. Super. It's hard work. And I love that you said uh, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. It's one of the most interesting concepts um, to, to sort of internalize. So often we come up with a, a solution, an idea, and we fall in love with that and we keep banging on it, but really we're not answering the right question. You know, if I say, uh, let's find a drug to, sur to solve a problem, you know, a, a cure an illness, well, maybe it's better to prevent it in the first place. Maybe the question should have been, how do we prevent people from getting that illness, as opposed to focus on how do we cure it after they already have it. So those are totally different questions that lead you to very, very different solutions. Martin, do you have anything to share? And then after Martin, we have Tim Sitzke. And, oh, great. And we also have David. Great. Perfect. So we had um, so after seeing all this material, we sat down and thought about two things. One platform is going to be making some pretty big bets in the next little while. So we wanted to see, how do we verify those? Is there some simple things we can do? So we've been thinking about how can we go out and talk to people, especially around embedding. Talked about this a lot. And do can we go and have conversations with people and tell them what we're about to do and see how they react? So that's one thing that we're going to start doing more aggressively as a consequence of these conversations. Another one is um, how to present the material. So a lot of the stuff we do is really deep and uh, technical and things like that. And using the story spine, uh, we, we we tried it out in our PLR we just did yesterday and. Uh, I think SCVP actually knew what we were talking about. <laughs> so that was a huge help uh, because we, we really reframed it around what the consequences were going to be as opposed to just what we were going to implement. And I think um, uh, those are, are hopefully going to lead us to better results. Great. I love that. So I love that the story spine, even though it looks like it's very simple, was able to allow you to communicate better with your colleagues, just even having that framework for here's the problem, here's the solution, here's the results. Well, we did it yesterday, so you have to ask them. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great. We think we did it. Great. So far, we did. Perfect. Were we going to go to San Francisco? Uh, we can go to San Francisco now. Okay. Yeah. Great. Lift it up a little. Okay, good. So, Perfect. Uh, San Francisco, Mr. Bryant. Hi, Brian. Uh, greetings from San Francisco. Uh, so two comments from me based on participating in last week's workshop. One, I've always been a huge fan of you know asking what problem you're trying to solve so the fall in love with the problem continually ask yourself sort of peeling away to get at the root problem that you're trying to solve was a, a, a nice to see that theme come through um, again the other piece was uh, I was particularly enamored of the concept of predo testing um, the idea that you're looking for the lightest possible weight to life's weight way to test an idea or get validation for what you're thinking I think we have a tendency, especially as engineers, to sort of immediately accelerate our thinking to what we think the actual final um, elements will be and trying to build something as close as possible with as much fidelity to that sort of thing. And the idea that you could test your assumptions by essentially tricking people um, into believing you had something that they might be interested in um, was, was a good concept. And we spent a fair amount of time looking at ways to peel away complexity to try to get at the simplest possible way of testing a great idea for a, a breakfast pizza or a hands-free toothbrush um, or other ideas that we explored in, in the workshop. So pre testing was, was a big one for me and take away from that experience. Great. And I think uh, one of the things we talked about is that oftentimes there is a hypothesis you have baked in to your product that is a rate limiting hypothesis, right? So Jeff Hawkins, the question was, would I carry it around in my pocket? Right? He knew he could build it, but if it wasn't going to be something he was going to carry, that it was going to be a failure. Uh, one of my favorite examples is, and I, I think we did it together last week, is uh, from the movie Minority Report. Did we do that? Where, um, you know, well, let me, let's do it with the group here because it's kind of fun. So uh, 
Let's say uh, in the movie, Tom Cruise is, is controlling all these computers with his hands like this, right? So, and that looks pretty cool. We can go off and build those computers. So I'd like everyone around the world to put their hands up. Everyone put their hands up. We'll see what, how many people are listening. And I want you to go and control the computer like this. How long do you want to do this? Not much longer, okay? So it might be that that's actually the rate limiting step is just the fact that people are not going to want to do that. So even though it seems like uh, that was a great idea and really exciting, you could quickly save a lot of money by saying people are not going to walk around with this. In fact, I was thinking about Google Glass, is that the prototype they did for that was they showed videos. Well, first of all, they made some mock-ups for the individuals, but they showed videos that they put on YouTube of what the world would look like with Google Glass. But you know what they didn't show is what the person wearing the Google Glass looked like, right? And that ended up being a rate-limiting step is when you were walking through the world, it was not you. It was the people who were looking at you who were unhappy and who were uncomfortable. And so in th they sort of missed that opportunity, right? And so they were looking at it from one perspective. If they had reframed it and said, how do people feel being looked at with Google Glass, they might have come up with some really different insights and they'd have chosen to implement a very different type of product. Make sense? David. Hi there, I'm David Bialer. Um, I'm on the Connected Devices team and, and did uh, Tina's workshop last week. And I, I will say one of the really fun things was to take the worst idea that the other team had, the other group had, and try to make that into a good idea. So our group had to take an alligator park, a family vacation, and the worst idea was going to an alligator park, and we had to turn that into a, a good idea. And if you want to hear some good ideas, put it on a Zeppelin. and. Um, but um, I am working on a project now. I just joined a project this week, actually, that is going through this phase of trying to validate the problem. And the problem has to do with um, what do I eat for dinner? How do I know the ingredients in my house? And, and what can I do to, um, to help make my meals faster and waste less food by knowing, what's in the, by knowing what I have on hand? But we're trying to actually validate that problem now. Is this indeed a problem that people have that they think about? And it's... So we're going through some talking now about having false stores, Facebook ads to see, you know, to, to pose the problem and see what kind of response we get to that problem. And, and that's one of the challenges to see if people have that problem. And it's probably worthwhile to figure that out um, or how to frame that problem differently, perhaps, um, before we invest a lot of money into developing the technology, which is, you know, very difficult to do and very expensive to do. Very cool. You know what's interesting about that is that you're doing both frame storming and brainstorming and prototyping there because you're going to have to do a lot of frame storming about how you ask the question, right? There are a zillion ways you could ask people the question that will unlock where the problem really is for them and where they perceive as the problem, right? Is the problem wasted food? Is the problem knowing what I have? Is the problem saving money? There might be lots of different ways to ask the question that's going to unlock some really interesting insights about what customers really want. And then, of course, testing it to see if you're going the right direction. So I... Oh, David did share. Okay, great. So I'd love to open it up to questions from anyone in the world. Does anyone here have a question, comment? The other thing is, even if you don't have a question or comment, I'm always interested in hearing what you found most interesting or valuable here, something that you could take away and think about using right away, you know, and um, so, so either a question or a comment. We have um, a couple questions. I just want to make sure we get them from the stream. Um, so someone um, asked, have you encountered the model of creativity that says a new idea is a new combination of old ideas? Absolutely right. In fact, one of the things that I feel strongly about is that one of the most powerful ways to come up with new ideas is by connecting, combining ideas that already are there. There are very few brand new ideas in the world, and so what we're doing is we're building upon layers and layers of innovation by taking what's there and, and building on it. And you're absolutely right. Connecting, combining is one of the most powerful tools. Great. You had a question. Oh, here you go. So I think a lot of times, um, especially with, with new ideas, people you know, gather feedback for the idea, and then they do the prenotype, and then they gather more feedback and iterate and iterate. And it's really easy to like, lose motivation. 
Um, what would you say to uh, a person who's lost motivation, how to keep that motivation, how to stay uh, on the idea and try to keep iterating? So it's interesting, motivation, uh, th that you bring that up. Motivation, if you don't have, let's see if we can go back here. No, that's not good. Oh, okay. If you don't have enough motivation in the creativity stage, you're not going to have enough persistence in the entrepreneurship stage. And so one of the key things is picking problems that you really, really care about. Because if you pick, and I'm sure you know this problem. I know it happens to me all the time. I pick some problem. Let's say it's, we're going back to the microphone. Oh, wow, this is really frustrating. I have all of this you know, extra cable. You know, honestly, I really don't care about this problem. It's not a problem I run into every single day. And so even though it's something like, wow, that's a, that's a frustration, I'm not really motivated to go and like start a whole business around this problem. Okay, maybe someone who's in the microphone business is going to be really motivated because this to them is a really interesting innovation in their field and they're really going to have an impact. But you need to pick a problem that you really care about at the beginning or else you're not going to be persistent enough. And so I, I think that's one way to think about it is are you working on the right problem? The other thing is to go back to the first stage, go back to imagination and engage. The more engaged you are with your customers, with the problem, with the, with the challenge, the more passionate you become about solving it. If you get really just sort of focused on all the details, it, it, you're absolutely right. It can, get, it can get frustrating. Another question? Yes, back there. Oh. Um, hi. So my question, I'm, I'm curious about those hundred ideas and the, and the worst ones, because um, I feel like we see the worst ones coming back online as business models or plant or products and, and whatnot. So wh how is is the decision what's a bad idea? Is that consensus driven? Oh, this is Does super it depend good question. or all good that question. stuff? Really, okay. really good question. And this is this is a place where people often fall into uh, a pit is the question of how do you decide what ideas you're going to pursue, right? So when you're brainstorming, it's super critical to understand that you are exploring the landscape, the entire landscape of possibilities. This is the exploration stage. When you decide what you're going to implement, you're in a totally different space. You're in the exploitation phase. And the, dis the space between the two has to be very, very wide. If you start evaluating the ideas too soon, you're going to kill the good ideas, and you're going to kill the really crazy ideas that might have a seed of possibility. So when you finish, a, now this is very important. When you do a brainstorming session, think about who's in the room. You don't want to necessarily just scoop up the people who are on your team, because your brainstorm is only as good as the brains in the room. Okay, And so you might want to be really, really thoughtful about who you invite to that brainstorm. You might want to bring in some customers. You might want to bring in people from very disparate fields who are going to bring very different points of view. And you're going to brainstorm with them. The key is they're not the decision makers. So at the end of a brainstorming session, what you want to do is you want to let people express their opinion about the ideas they like the most, but you thank them very much and have them go away. The next stage, which is a different time, you cannot have the evaluation stage happen at the same time you brainstorm. Otherwise, they, they, um, they get conflated, and you don't actually end up with all these great ideas because people are evaluating them. Well, you know, that idea is never going to work. Okay? I mean, it might be that we look at it tomorrow or next week, and we go, you know, there's a seed of something interesting in there. Okay, so you want to have the evaluation stage where you start saying, okay, what are the possibilities? What are the quick experiments we can do? And you want data, right? I'm sure you guys love data, okay? You want to get some data from the outside validation. If you're just doing it in your head, that's just fantasy. You want to have some hypotheses around these ideas and to test them. And if you do pre-totyping, then what's going to happen is you get these really, really quick feedback on your idea, right? Your idea of looking in people's refrigerators and knowing what they have, that's like, let's get some quick data to see if it's actually something people care about. You know, if you throw it away after that quick experiment, no one's going to cry. They're only going to cry if you've spent months and years solving the problem and then nobody wants it. Hope that helps. Another we question. Have, we have one in San Francisco and then one from the stream after that. Okay. I wanted to know if there are other universities besides Stanford or accelerators or incubators that are applying the process. Oh my goodness, yes. This, these processes are being um, 
are being used all over the place. Uh, our graduates of our classes go off and they are join, you know, join organizations all over the world. And in fact, I'm really fortunate. I get a chance to talk to different companies, and um, I'm actually working with Microsoft pretty closely. And uh, they decided that this invention cycle model was one that really resonated, and they're now using it in all 120 of their innovation centers around the world. So um, yes, and um, I found that people are extraordinarily appreciative of having the shared vocabulary and framework that allows them to know, OK, we're, what are we talking about? Make sure we're on the same page uh, and know where we're going. Yes, absolutely. And then one from the stream is, um, I think there's generally a lot of interest in, in breaking down a bit more on framestorming. So the question is, is maybe an example of how framestorming works, just to, to make it a little bit more tangible. Right. So the example I gave before was, of course, planning a birthday party for me. OK. Uh, but you can do it with anything. What would be a problem that, um, let's see, let's, maybe we could do a real live problem. Um, you know, OK. You might say, um, what are we going to make for dinner? Right? I mean, so that would be a simple problem in your everyday life. What am I going to make for dinner? But the question might be, well, how do I feed my family? Feeding my family is really different than making dinner, right? There are going to be lots of ways in which I feed my family, OK? Maybe the question is, how do I keep my family healthy? Maybe it's a broader question. So there are, or how do I make, maybe it's feeding my, them dinner is really not about um, the dinner. Maybe it's about how do I get my family to spend an hour together in the evening. Maybe that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So really thinking about what you're trying to solve opens up all different possibilities. I don't know. Maybe can we ask if that, um, did that help? Yeah. I, um, I don't know. If that, if that doesn't help, feel free to reach out to me. I would be happy to go further. But the fact is having that framestorming process where you try to figure out what problem I'm really going to solve, another way to do that, so a trick, is the why ladder. How many of you have heard of the why ladder? OK, where you ask why, like, OK, why do I want to feed my family? Well, I want them to be, you know. Why do I want to make dinner? Well, I, I want to feed my family. Oh, that's the next question you ask. Why do I want to feed my family? Well, I want them to be healthy. Oh, that's the next question to ask. So if you keep asking why is a great way for you to unlock uh, different frames for the problem. Right. Any other questions here? Yeah, time for maybe one more. Um, so I know. The example, the video that you showed, it was a single person coming up with 100 ideas. Um, where do you see like the most interesting ideas? Is it with individuals? Is it with teams? Is it with big organizations? Like where, like what, what's the? Yeah, so, so the question is, when do you have an individual? When do you have a team? When do you have an organization? It really depends on the type of problem. I work on teams personally. I'll just give you my personal answer. I work on teams all the time. I co-teach all of my classes. I work with large teams of students. I work with big groups off <laughs> online. There are benefits to all of them, right? When you work on a team, uh, you then have to add in all the interesting team dynamics, which makes it complicated. On the other hand, you have the benefits of getting different points of view. When you work by yourself, you don't have to fight with anyone else, but you're limited in terms of the number of inputs and the different points of view. So I, for example, I write books. And I always write those books by myself. I don't have a co-author. I really love that process of going deep into my own brain. You know, this model grew out of years of study and thinking and experiences. Um, I didn't co-create it. I said, I want to do it myself. And there's an incredible, like if I make a painting, I do it by myself. I don't co-create that painting. On the other hand, there are other things that I get great value out of working with others. And people bring in points of view and ideas. So I think going back and forth and being able to do it by yourself, but also knowing when to invite people in, is really powerful. And I invite you to try all of them and see the balance you want in your life and your team. Great. Well, I hope that this was um, helpful, meaningful to you. I welcome uh, any feedback later. I'm easy to reach at uh, my uh, Twitter handle is at tcleague, but that's also my email is tcleague at stanford.edu. Feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.